morning. I'm very excited about welcoming everyone to the 2020 Chancellor's Health Policy Lecture. I'm Claire Brindis, and I'm the director of the Philip R. Lee Institute for Health Policy Studies. And I'd just like to take a couple of minutes explaining what the Chancellor's Health Policy Lecture is and introduce to you our current Chancellor, Sam Hallgood, and give you a little bit of background. But most of our time today will be devoted to a very special guest. The Chancellor's Health Policy Lecture uh, was established in 2006 by then Chancellor Mike Bishop with the tremendous encouragement and support of a very dear friend, Steve Schroeder. And the purpose of the lecture is to really bring star health policy leaders to our campus in recognition of the very important role that health policy plays in establishing the landscape, establishing the environment in which we conduct our work. And because so many of you are involved in research, in training, in clinical care, in community service that shapes policy in California, in our nation, and in the world, it's also an opportunity to celebrate the role of health policy in our lives. And I wanna acknowledge the wonderful uh, support of the Student Leadership Forum group in diversity and inclusion who will be meeting in this room right at the end and the conclusion of this lecture. So I'm gonna ask that we respect their time here and we will be leaving promptly. The, for me personally, it is really an honor to give you a little bit of background on our own Chancellor, Sam Hoggood. Sam brings a particular sensitivity to the importance of policy both in his own professional work and in his leadership skills and responsibilities. And I want to acknowledge that he began his career at UCSF in 1982 as a research fellow. And the work that he conducted in terms of low infant born babies with pulmonary problems contributed to massive changes in the way that we deliver health care to our most vulnerable citizens and have probably saved the lives of millions of people around the globe. It was this kind of work that helped to generate his, all, his career at UCSF, and I would uh, hazard to guess that there are people in this room who have probably benefited from Sam's instrumental and groundbreaking research. His leadership at UCSF has included being a division chair, uh, excuse me, a division lead in, um, in the Department of Pediatrics, the chair of pediatrics, then dean, and then, uh, then becoming the chancellor. Under his leadership, the school has really grown substantially, partly because of his vision and his leadership style that is very inclusive. And we are really one of the top most research institutions recognized both in terms of our NIH funding, but also the contributions that many of you make in the policy research training and service arenas. And I wanna just thank Sam for having been such a wonderful leader and welcome him to the stage. Thank you, uh, Claire, for those uh, embarrassingly generous uh, remarks. But uh, it, it is indeed a real honor for me to be here today and to look out on this audience, uh, many of you who are helping uh, shape the uh, future uh, of, uh, as Claire said, not only our city, but our state, our country, uh, and the world. I would like also to, uh, uh, right at the outset, thank Claire for your remarkable leadership of the Health Policy Institute for so many years and the way that you and your team uh, continue to shine a light uh, on the importance of health policy uh, and the role that health policy has in driving true transformational change uh, at all levels of healthcare throughout the country. 2020, it's a little hard to say, uh, but we are uh, at the start of a new decade, but clearly uh, still in a uh, point of political uncertainty in this country. And I think that uncertainty uh, continues to underscore the critical importance of getting health policy right. Policy that can last beyond any given political uh, leadership or regime, and good policy uh, doesn't just come out of thin air, it comes from very hard work, analytic work, 
uh, a continual review of outcomes, and it's that kind of work that our Institute for Health Policy uh, does here at UCSF. It underscores the commitment across the entirety of UCSF uh, to the health and well-being of our own community. And by community, I not only define our community here in the Bay Area, but our community across the state of California, our community across the country uh, of the US and our community in our global health uh, efforts. I'm very optimistic uh, as I look out to this room this morning and for those that I know will uh, follow this uh, online who can't be with us today, uh, it gives me great optimism that the contributions of all of you uh, uh, will have profound uh, impact on our ongoing struggles to affect uh, health disparities amongst the most vulnerable populations that we serve. Uh, through the efforts uh, of many of you and others uh, at UCSF at times clash with political sentiment, sentiments, it's our strength uh, as a university uh, that stems from the culture that embraces these, these kind of challenges. Uh, we all work together, uh, as I like to say, to tackle uh, the globe's biggest and most difficult problems. And so it's within that spirit that it gives me a great pleasure to introduce uh, the 2020 Chancellor's Lecturer on Public Policy, and that is Dr. Nadine Burke-Harris. <laughs> Dr. Burke-Harris is an award-winning physician, researcher, and advocate who has dedicated her career to changing the way our society responds to one of the most serious pervasive, expensive, and widespread public health crises of our time, that is childhood trauma. She was appointed, as, as I'm sure all of you know, as California's first ever Surgeon General by Governor Gavin Newsom in January 2019. Her career has been dedicated to serving the most vulnerable communities and combating the root causes of health disparities. Uh, we at UCSF have already had uh, great opportunities to work closely with Dr. Harris, and I'm sure that this lecture uh, will once again uh, be just the start of wonderful things that we can do together. And Nadine, I pledge that uh, UCSF will do everything we can to make your tenure as our very first Surgeon General uh, a roaring success. So please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Burke Harris to the podium. Thank you so much. Uh, it's such a privilege and an honor uh, to have the opportunity to speak to you this morning. And I'm excited to jump into this conversation about applying the science of toxic stress to transform health outcomes in California. In uh, February of last year, it was actually February 11th, 2019, when I was sworn in by the governor as California's first Surgeon General. And in the governor's executive order creating the role of California Surgeon General, one of the things that he did was recognize um, the health this uh, early adversity and recognize social determinants of health as root causes of some of the most severe, intractable, and expensive challenges that are facing California today. And that was the reason why he created the role of State Surgeon General. Specifically, he charged me to go upstream and address those root causes in a way that is systemic and sustainable. And together, we identified for the Office of the Surgeon General three key priorities that I really wanted to work on, uh, which include health equity, early childhood, and adverse childhood experiences, and, and toxic stress. Now, I don't know where y'all were on November 5th, 2019, but I can tell you where I was. At 6 a.m., I was in the Citizen Hotel in Sacramento when in came my, in, my email, adverse childhood experiences, was on the cover of the MMWR, the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. <laughs> 
Now, I know that many of you in the room, like me, are public health nerds, right? And so cover of MMWR is like cover of Vogue, right? <laughs> <laughs> this was like, I literally was like jumping up and down and screaming. And um, the reason was because when the CDC issued a special, uh, a special issue of the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report recognizing adverse childhood experiences as a major public health threat, that was just a such a powerful signal, right, nationally about uh, it, it, I feel like it was our moment of breaking through, right? It was such a powerful signal nationally about the importance of this work and this research and uh, early adversity as a major risk factor for health uh, and, and disease. And as I jump into talking a little bit about uh, California's approach to addressing adverse childhood experiences, I want to start by recognizing that we're talking about childhood adversity. Right? And so when we're talking about ACEs, we're not talking about that other auditorium with those other folks, right? For a lot of us, right, we're talking about many of us in this room who have had these experiences. And before, so before I jump into this, I just want to recognize that if anyone needs to take a moment or um, excuse themselves, please, that's we want um, folks to do what they need to support themselves. But when we talk about adverse childhood experiences, um, in, in reviewing uh, the traditional criteria, right, as I look around the room, I know many of folks are familiar with ACEs. But just as a reminder that when we talk about ACEs, we're referring to the criteria from the ACE study. And those include the 10 criteria, including physical, emotional, and sexual abuse, physical and emotional neglect, and uh, growing up in a household where a parent was mentally ill, substance dependent, incarcerated, where there was parental separation or divorce, or domestic violence. So these are the 10 traditional ACE criteria. We recognize that there are other adversities that are not included in that, right? Things like discrimination, being separated from your parent or caregiver through deportation or migration, right? There are, there are lots of other adversities that are, weren't necessarily included, but when we look at the data, when we say for an individual who has four more ACEs, their relative risk of a health condition is X, right? It's really important that we are comparing apples to apples and oranges to oranges, right? And not um, and, and, and being clear when we're talking about the traditional ACE criteria versus other risk factors for long-term uh, uh, negative health outcomes. But what the ACE study told us was two really, really powerful things, right? And I feel like I'm, I'm here at UCSF looking, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir so you all could be telling me this information. But the, the two, the first really important thing that it told us was that ACEs are incredibly common. Right? So this doesn't just happen in certain zip codes or to certain folks, right? But uh, when we look here in California, two thirds, uh, sorry, 62.7% of Californians have experienced at least one adverse childhood experience. And 17.6% of Californians have experienced four or more ACEs. And that really defied common wisdom, I think, for many, right? That these things only happen in certain places, right? Or to certain people. But the other piece of it that was um, really powerful is that the original A study happened in a community, was, uh, was conducted in a community that was 70% Caucasian, 70% college educated. Right? So really, this is all of us. And we, when we look at the traditional ACEs data, um, the, the most recent data for which we have a full breakdown of, uh, we, we have, uh, or at least some data around racial and ethnic data, what we see is that in, um, uh, in California, the rate of, the prevalence of ACEs across uh, different racial and ethnic groups is actually really similar, right? with our Hispanic and Latino communities reporting the highest rate of ACEs and our Asian American communities reporting the lowest rates. We also see that, um, a, as is not surprising, when we look nationally uh, at the prevalence of ACEs, right, among those with uh, you know, moderate to upper income, the prevalence is very similar than what they saw in the ACE study, it was 13.2%. Uh, of individuals having four or more ACEs, but among individuals who are low income, 
right, or in poverty, that number doubles, right? So we really see this profound effect of um, uh, greater, those who are low income being at greater risk. So the first thing that we understood was that ACEs are really common. They affect all communities, but they uh, affect communities in poverty more severely. Um, the second thing that they found in the study, right, was that there was a dose response relationship between these adverse childhood experiences, right, and not just the stuff that we kind of commonly associate with having a rough childhood, right, increased risk of mental or behavioral disorders or increased risk of substance dependence, and we do see that strong association, but we see this dramatically increased risk for things like heart disease and cancer and autoimmune disease. Right? And in fact, here we have a list of the 10 leading causes of death in the United States. And over the past two decades, since the ACE study was published, what we've identified was that ACE has dramatically increased the risk for nine out of 10 of the leading causes of death in the US. Right? Similarly, we also see, we do see you know, some of those uh, kind of expected uh, or more commonly known dose response relationships between adverse childhood experiences and negative mental health outcomes. Substance use, homelessness, right? When we look here in California as we are, as I'm working with my colleagues across the Newsom administration to grapple with and respond to the homelessness crisis, right? What we see is that there is pr this profound dose response relationship between ACEs and homelessness. And so when we look at all of these associations, it's really easy to feel like it's gloom and doom, right? Like, oh my goodness, you have ACEs and it's so rough and it just feels like you're destined to have terrible outcomes. But for me, one of the things that's always, anyone who knows me really well will tell you that one of my favorite things to do is to try to figure out how to take a weakness and turn it into a strength, right? So, you know, this, uh, this list of, uh, when we look at homelessness and recognizing that's such a big crisis and it's such a big priority uh, for the administration, we see mental health is such a big priority uh, for the administration. That list of the, you know, nine out of 10 leading causes of death, they're expensive, right? And so as we, one of the things that's been absolutely critical for me is recognizing that Addressing ACEs is not just a moral imperative and an ethical imperative, it's also an economic imperative. And the more that we recognize that, the, more, the clearer it is that we can no longer afford not to put the resources in place to address this issue in a systematic way. And um, just, I wanna say last week, two weeks ago, right, there was a study uh, published that the annual cost of ACEs to the state of California for just these eight health conditions, right? This doesn't include the cost of incarceration, this doesn't include the cost to our educational system, it doesn't include, for just these eight health conditions is $112.5 billion per year. That's over a trillion dollars in the next decade, right? We do not have an option other than to take, tackle this challenge head on. Because you wanna know what? You wanna know what the good news is? The good news is that ACEs are not destiny, right? And what the research shows us is that with early detection and evidence-based intervention, we can transform health outcomes. But in order to do that, we have to understand the mechanism, right? We need to have that blueprint to better understand what are the levers that are going to improve these outcomes. And uh, you know, as Surgeon General, one of the things that I do is, is look back at other models of how we have effectively disrupted major public health challenges. And a great example is um, HIV AIDS, right? So back in the early 80s, I'm looking around the room, there's enough people here who were around in the early 80s. I myself was in elementary school. Uh, but, <laughs> you know. Anyway, uh, so back in the early 80s, right? 
<laughs> doctors were seeing uh, patients come into the emergency room uh, with these like surprisingly high rates of tuberculosis, right? And doctors say, oh, TB. I know how to treat that. Write the prescription, send them out. And then they came, were coming in with the surprisingly high rates of this weird pneumonia, pneumocystis pneumonia. Doctor said, gosh, you know, pneumocystis, I don't see that all that often, but I know I can look it up. Look up the treatment, take care of the patient, send them home. And then patients were coming in with this rare skin lesion, so Kaposi sarcoma. Doctor said, listen, I, you know what? I know I don't know how to treat that, right? Because this is really uncommon. But you guess what? I have a colleague who does know. So I'm going to refer you to my colleague. He's going to patch you up. I'm going to send you out. And what happened? Right? Patients kept on coming back. And when they came back, they were sicker and sicker and sicker. So much so, in fact, that it was on the cover of the MMWR, right? The Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. Uh, back in, uh, I believe it was 1980, 1981, right? And we sounded the alarm on this public health crisis. And we began to look systematically to better understand what was going on. And we figured out, oh my goodness, you know what? It's a virus. It's not just a virus, it's a retrovirus. And through the collaborative efforts of researchers across the country, we were able to develop antiretrovirals. And when we put that treatment into place, what we saw was that the death rate from HIV AIDS plummeted. Mean mortality went from six months, 50% of people were dead six months from diagnosis, to now on standard antiretroviral therapy, the uh, life expectancy is greater than 50 years from diagnosis. Ladies and gentlemen, we did that in 30 years, OK? And I want to point out something which is my absolute favorite part of this slide. That top line in the blue, that's the death rate for African American males. That second line in the red is the death, ma uh, death rate for Hispanic and Latino males. And many people probably didn't think about researchers developing antiretrovirals as a tool for health equity, right? We often don't think about biomedical research as a tool for health equity. But when you have a condition that disproportionately harms those who are greatest, most marginalized, that when you develop effective interventions, right, we see that these marginalized communities are the ones who stand the most to benefit. So taking that framework and the, uh, that approach, when we look to understand the biology of adversity, right, uh, understanding these biological mechanisms so we can better understand how ACEs, right, put us at increased risk for morbidity and mortality, for negative health and social outcomes. We can use that knowledge to disrupt those processes and improve outcomes. And I see a bunch of familiar faces in the room. So ladies and gentlemen, if you know this part, just go ahead and sing along, right? <laughs> so how does it work, right? So you imagine you're walking in the forest. So this all boils down to our, our biological fight or flight response. And it works all something like this. You're walking in the forest, and you see this guy, right? What happens in our brains and bodies, right? First of all, did I scare you even a little bit? <laughs> now, you know, not too bad, but just enough so you might be like, oh, OK, I get it. Um, but what happens? Immediately, our amygdala, right, the brain's fear center, sounds the alarm. Right? And, and activates the release of stress hormones, including adrenaline and cortisol. So our hearts start to pound. Our pupils dilate. Our airways open up. Right? We shunt blood to our large skeletal muscles for running and jumping. And away from that itty bitty muscle that holds your bladder closed so you might pee your pants. <laughs> no judgment. Right? But so you're ready, right? You're ready to either fight that bear or run from the bear. But if you were to think about it, fighting a bear wouldn't seem like a good idea, would he? No, look at him. He's big. He's got teeth. He's got claws. And that's why our amygdala sends projections to the prefrontal cortex, right? The part that's responsible for a judgment and impulse control and executive functioning and turns it way, way down. 
Because if you're in a forest and there's a bear, the last thing you want is impulse control getting in the way of survival, right? And instead, what it does is it turns up the part of the brain called the noradrenergic nucleus of the locus ceruleus, or as I like to call it, the part of the brain responsible for, I don't know karate, but I do know karate, right? <laughs> Thank you, James Brown. <laughs> right? So this is, this, is, this is the part that gets us amped up. And the less obvious thing that happens when you activate your stress response is that it also activates your immune response. Because if that bear gets his claws into you, you want your immune system to be primed to bring inflammation, to stabilize that wound so that you can live long enough to either beat that bear or get away. It's brilliant. It was evolved over millennia to save our lives from a mortal threat. But the problem is what happens when that bear comes home every night. And this biological response is activated over and over and over again. And it goes from being life-saving or adaptive to being maladaptive or health damaging. And children are especially vulnerable to this repeated activation of the stress response because their brains and bodies are just developing. So high doses of adversity in childhood are associated with changes to the structure and function of children's developing brains, their developing immune systems, hormonal systems, and even the way their DNA is read and transcribed. And these long-term changes to the brain and biological systems is what is now known as the toxic stress response. Right? So when the A study was originally published, right, they say, hey, folks said, hey, listen, uh, this information, it's great to know, but what do you want us to do with this? Because you, uh, you have ACEs, and it may incre increase your risk of heart disease, but by the time you have the heart disease, there's nothing that you can do about the ACEs that you had in the past. Like, what, what are we supposed to do with this? Well, there are a couple of things. Number one is that we now understand, right, in the, sev in the two decades since the ACE study has been published, that the signs and symptoms of toxic stress are evident as early as infancy, right? So uh, in babies, we see increased risk of developmental delay, growth delay, f uh, failure to thrive, sleep disruption. And then as kids get older, we see a litany of symptoms from increased risk of asthma, pneumonia, viral infections, right? Moving all the way to uh, headache and abdominal pain, increased risk of teen pregnancy, autoimmune disorders, et cetera. And as folks get older, right, what we recognize is that biological toxic stress response. I used to wonder, right, hey, I get it. These things were, happened to you when you were a kid. You had, you had this um, uh, overactive stress response. But then by the time you get to be an adult, you've long since left that household, right? So why would you have this continued activation of the stress response? And this is where this genetic regulatory component uh, comes in, right? Because what we see is not only um, uh, changes to the way our stress response is wired, right? So we have an increased, uh, so, so that changes to the way our stress responsivity is long term, right? But we also see increased vulnerability to subsequent stressors over the life course. And this toxic stress response, uh, we even see that. Individuals, for example, uh, women who are, become pregnant, who, women who had high ACEs who become pregnant have increased risk of ne negative prenatal and perinatal outcomes. And their offspring also have increased uh, stress sensitivity and vulnerability. But, and what is so powerful, when we now understand that this is the mechanism, we can use the science to break the cycle. Because just as we talk about the activation of the stress response, just as our bodies evolved, right, this biological stress response to save our lives from a mortal threat, our bodies similarly evolved physiologic mechanisms to regulate, right, or counterbalance the stress response. 
And what we see and what the research shows us is that the characterization, characterization of the toxic stress response is actually only one end of the spectrum. We recognize that the, the stress response is characterized in three ways. Positive stress response, that's what's saving you from the bear, right? And let's all remember, the folks who didn't uh, evolve the stress response, they didn't live long enough to reproduce, right? <laughs> so the positive stress response, and then the tolerable stress response occurs when the stressor is more severe, more prolonged, more intense. But this little yellow uh, box here was so important that I highlighted it in yellow, right? And I'll take a second to read it. Homeostasis, the body's biological balance, recovers through the buffering effect of a caring adult or other interventions. I'm going to repeat that. Homeostasis recovers through the buffering effect of a caring adult or other interventions. And that actually, it only moves into being this toxic stress response when we don't have adequate buffering, right? And what we see is that these measures of our biological ability to recover from adversity and counteract that biological stress response, that also can be tracked and measured in the science. In fact, MRI studies found that institutionalized children who were randomized into high quality nurturant caregiving, and I'm not going to comment on how sad it is it is that kids have to be randomized into high quality nurturing caregiving. But in any case, right? When these kids were randomized at age two into, random, uh, into nurturing caregiving environment, their MRI studies at age eight showed normalization of the developmental trajectory of the white matter structures in their brains, right? We see interventions like uh, meditation being associated with decreased inflammatory markers right? Um, and that social support protected against the infection risk associated with increased frequency of conflict. We see that oxytocin, right? This is my favorite hormone, I will say. So this is really, really fascinating. I'm going to say this as a mom, and my husband and I have four boys, and I know there's probably a lot of parents in the audience. What happens when our, parent, when our kids experience something you know, frightening or scary or terrible? Uh, and I don't, I don't know that there is a household across the world that is ever spared from scary or stressful things happening to or in front of children. right? But when that happens, as a mom, what's my instinct? What do I do automatically? I scoop up my boys, and I hug them up, and I love them up. Right? And I tell them, you're OK, and you are safe. And what that does is that it releases oxytocin in their brains and bodies. And it turns out oxytocin, this is the boss's hormone. It inhibits the stress response. It enhances bonding. It protects against stress-induced cell death. It has anti-inflammatory effects. It enhances metabolic homeostasis. And it protects the vascular endothelium, the lining on the inside of our arteries. Right? So we see that our body is wired to have these um, healing and protective mechanisms. And we see that these aspects of nurturant caregiving, y'all, I was just quick show of hands. How many folks are familiar with the uh, Michael Meany study on the rat pups? Right? A good number. Well, I'm just going to tell the story anyway, because it's one of my favorite stories, right? So Michael Meany, McGill University, he was doing, you know, he's a stress physiology researcher. He he's, has these uh, rat pups, and he uh, he's, uh, takes the rat babies after they're born, and he has a research assistant stress them out, right? Handles them, mess around with them, and then he gives them back to their moms. And some of the moms instinctively did lots of nurturing caregiving. Oh, my baby, I'm so sorry that horrible man was handling you like that. And did lots of licking and grooming and nurturing, right? And some moms, mm, not so much, right? And what Meany and his team found was that the, the, the offspring of the moms who did lots of nurturant care, guess what? They performed better on cognitive tests. 
they had a more normally functioning stress response that turned itself off after a stressor more normally. And when they themselves became parents, they became high nurturant parents. And what they looked at was say, what is this associated with? And they found that the regulation was not in the genetic code, but it was actually in, a epi, in the epigenome, the, the, gen, the markers that sit on top of our DNA that regulates which parts of our DNA are expressed or not. And then, I don't, I, I have a sneaking suspicion that maybe Dr. Meany has a penchant for lifetime television. I don't know, right? But he did a crazy thing. He and his team did a crazy thing. With the next generation, they switched the pups at birth. And so the, the pups that were biologically from the low nurturing moms, they put them with a high nurturing foster mom. Right? And they did this, repeated the same experiment. And the foster mom did the same thing. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, honey, lots of nurturing caregiving. And guess what happened? Those pups who were raised by high nurturing mom, they performed better on cognitive tests. They had a more normally functioning stress response. They, in the next generation, became more nurturant parents. And their epigenetic markers modeled their foster mom not their biological mom, right? When we are talking about the power of nurturant caregiving, we are talking about the power to change our biology down to our DNA. And what we looked at, well, you know, my, my team at my former organization, the Center for East Wellness, what we looked at, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands, about 20,000 studies, we kind of summarized the literature into like six fast and easy steps that we can all implement at home, right? Um, and those are sleep, exercise, nutrition, mindfulness, mental health, and healthy relationships. All of these interventions reduce stress hormones, reduce inflammation, enhance neuroplasticity, and are associated with uh, improved epigenetic regulation. And when we are talking about the impacts of nurturant care, right, this is not just an academic exercise. Uh, in in uh, a group in Wales looked at the impact of nurturant caregiving on health outcomes. And specifically, they looked at um, uh, health protective behavior, like uh, fruits and vegetable consumption. They looked at health harming behaviors. And they also looked at mental well being. Let me just take a quick second. It's a little complicated slide, but I'm just going to take a second to, to walk you through it. These, um, the solid bars are uh, the solid bars are without nurturant caregiving. The hash bars are with nurturant caregiving. So let's just let's just point to, to this one right here, right? And the and the red is high aces, and uh, the gray is is no aces, right? So you'll see. Uh, starting, on the, starting over on this side, if you've got high ACEs and no nurturant caregiving, those are the worst outcomes. If you have high uh, ACEs and you have lots of nurturant caregiving, you can reduce the negative health impacts by more than half. Right? In fact, for, for many of these outcomes, you'll see that the high ACEs high nurturant caregiving health impacts were almost the same as the no ACEs, no nurturant caregiving, right? Very, very close. And of course, the best off are the no ACEs, high nurturant caregiving. So across the studies, what we see is that regardless of the presence of ACEs, buffering care is associated with better outcomes, full stop, right? However, for those, uh, particular study in Wales said, for those with four or more ACEs, the presence of all of the buffering care assets reduced the prevalence of total childhood poor health, including asthma, allergies, headache, digestive disorders, and school absenteeism from 59.8% to 21.3%. Let me tell you, if there was a drug that could reduce the prevalence of negative health outcomes from 59.8% to 21.3%, I would want to be, I would want to have some shares in that drug, right? This is powerful, 
right? We have the power to transform outcomes for the next generation. And so coming into my role as California's first Surgeon General, I have set a bold goal to cut ACEs and toxic stress in half in one generation. And I know that sounds ambitious. And at the risk of being laughed out of the room, I will tell you folks, I did not come into this job to do things by half measures and believe that we can't get things done. I am here to go big or go home. And particularly because, ladies and gentlemen, we have done it before. When we look at uh, the prevalence of, of cigarette use, smoking, by teens, the prevalence went from 25% to, let's see, 25% in 2001-ish to 3.6% uh, by the end of the 20 teens. Ladies and gentlemen, we did that in two decades. But more specifically, when we look here in California at our maternal mortality rate, California maternal mortality was reduced by 55% between 2006 and 2014 through a concerted initiative called the California Maternal Quality Care Collaborative, where we explicitly put into place across the, the 200 hospitals where 98% of the births in California take place, we explicitly put into place clinical protocols tracking and addressing the major drivers of maternal mortality. And we achieved that 55% reduction in mor maternal mortality here in California, while nationally maternal mortality continued to rise, which is the red uh, uh, bar, right? We can do this. And we do this by looking at the evidence, and we do this by systematically deploying all of the resources that are at our disposal. And what the evidence shows us is that number one, we have to intervene early. The National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine last July issued their Vibrant and Healthy Kids report. I know you all read all 500 and umpteen pages of it. I, I, I'm sure it's on your nightstand like it is on my nightstand, right? But what it tells us is that um, the preconception through early life periods are foundational for healthy development across the life course. And biologically, a number of critical systems are developing, and humans have high plasticity during these life stages. So early detection and early intervention is absolutely critical. It also tells us that we have to address the systemic and structural factors. Because individual experiences within systems vary dramatically based on racial, cultural, and other personal characteristics. And while the effects of these systemic factors are by no means deterministic, they do help to set the odds. And when different odds play out over time, they systematically generate different health outcomes. So a health equity approach requires systems to change in ways that improve opportunities for good experiences and reduce the odds of adverse exposures. And what the National Academies did was laid out this important conceptual framework we're in the middle, in that dark blue, right? There's the biological, psychological, and socio-behavioral development. A lot of the biological mechanisms of toxic stress that I have been talking about earlier in, in my talk. But we recognize that what shapes our biological environment, what shapes whether that, that inflammation, the hormonal release, right? That buffering response, our family cohesion, social connections, and caregiver well-being to support healthy child development. And what shapes a caregiver's ability to be well and shape their child development? Well, healthy living conditions, early care and education, our health care system. And what shapes all of that are structural inequities and our socioeconomic and political drivers. And in the, in the Newsom administration, 
I promise you, right now, we have folks who are working on all fronts, right, to drive towards health and health equity to, to the extent possible, to shape, to infuse every aspect of, of each of these drivers with factors that drive towards health and well-being. And one of the key parts of that initiative is something that I'm really, really proud to be leading. Because as we also saw from the National Academy's uh, report, there was a recommendation to adopt and implement screening for trauma and adversities early in life to increase the likelihood of early detection and an acknowledgement that this has to include creating rapid response and referral systems that can quickly bring protective resources to bear when early life adversities are detected through coordinated cross-sector expertise. So California's approach is number one, to establish primary prevention by addressing the systemic and structural factors and deploying a coordinated public education campaign to systematically deploy broad-scale screening for adverse childhood experiences to enable early detection and early intervention of ACEs and toxic stress, to interrupt vertical transmission of ACEs by advancing screening not only in children, but also in adults with special focus on the prenatal and early parenting years to coordinate and strengthen our network of referral and treatment systems to make them more effective, accountable, and easy to navigate for children, adults, and providers, and to advance the science of toxic stress and identify potential therapeutic targets, right? We need to deploy every, re I'm waiting for the antiretrovirals for the toxic stress response, right? Um, and to improve the efficacy of our interventions. And when we look, right, we recognize that these are all part of a larger picture. The biomedical research, the primary care screening and response, trauma-informed clinical care, our coordination of our county and local networks of care, cross-sector training and competency, uh, and public awareness. And the Governor Newsom, in a historic investment, has dedicated more than $160 million over the course of the next three years to uh, reimburse providers for screening. For once, it's not an unfunded mandate, right? Um, and then also invest in training providers how to screen and how to respond with trauma-informed care. We've also allocated $9 million to the California Initiative to Advance Precision Medicine to look at uh, to use precision medicine approaches to identifying ACEs and toxic stress and effective interventions. And we're also, in the coming uh, uh, budget year, fingers crossed, knock on wood, right, uh, hoping for an additional $10 million for cross-sector training uh, in the early childhood, government workers, education, and law enforcement sectors so that all of our response systems are trauma-informed and ACEs-aware. The ACEs-aware uh, initiative is this initiative that we have deployed to, to be able to address uh, ACEs and toxic stress uh, across providers. It includes training, clinical protocols, and, and payment. Our clinical tools are available on the website acesaware.org. And um, I'll give just a quick highlight of what those clinical tools look like, as, I, as you can imagine. But all of this, I'll, I'll say, is available on the website. And I'll go very quickly as I recognize that timing is running short. So our adult screening tool uh, looks like this. There are two versions. It lists the 10 traditional ACEs. And this is the de-identified version in which we ask providers, in which providers ask their patients not to say which ACEs that they have experience, experienced, but only how many. There's also an identified version where, where patients are, uh, can say which ones that they've experienced. Uh, I will say, based on uh, my own experience as co-investigator for 
the uh, pediatric, for the Pearl study on which a lot of, some of this research is based. And I see my two co-investigators, shout out. Um, uh, we recognize that actually the de-identified version in unpublished data, so don't be mad at me, unpublished version, but the de-identified version um, actually facilitated greater patient comfort and greater disclosure. So, um, so we have the adult screening tool, the pediatric screening tool also includes the, the um, 10 traditional ACEs, and then separately includes other social determinants of health that we recognize to also be risk factors for the toxic stress response. Uh, we've included a simple clinical workflow that primary care providers can refer to, just like we do clinical algorithms for anything else in primary care, and also a uh, uh, adverse childhood experiences and toxic stress risk assessment algorithm to help providers understand whether their patient is at low risk, intermediate risk, or high risk of a toxic stress response, right? Because again, the focus is, is we, we screen for ACEs as the most expedient and evidence-based way of understanding which patients are at risk of having a toxic stress response. But what we want to be treating is that biology of toxic stress. And we do that by providing patient education about toxic stress, its likely role in the patient's health condition, and resilience. We assess for protective factors and jointly uh, formulate a treatment plan, and then link patients to supportive services and treatment as appropriate. Right? As much as possible, we want this to be simple and actionable for every primary care provider across the state of California. We include a list of, what, um, of ACE associated health conditions. And as you all look at this list, I know that this, uh, the print is really small, right? But um, intentionally, as the, the committee who worked on developing this list, one of the things that we did was we recognized that things like depression, suicide attempts, anxiety, we put those on the bottom half of the list because those are the things that people are really familiar with as being associated with ACEs. But things like cardiovascular disease, tachycardia, asthma, diabetes, hepatitis, arthritis, right? Those are some of the, the, the things that many providers are less familiar with having a strong association with ACEs. So these are the um, adult uh, clinical tools. We also have the same clinical tools available for pediatrics. Right? And as providers are encouraged to do their treatment planning, treatment planning consists of, uh, number one, applying the principles of trauma-informed care, including establishing trust, safety, and collaborative decision-making. But number two, identification and treatment of ACE-associated health conditions by supplementing usual care with patient education on toxic stress and strategies to regulate the stress response. Right? So for that adult provider, you've just made a diagnosis, you've just identified a patient with diabetes, in addition to prescribing that metformin, if that patient has a high ACE score, you also have to say, you know what, because of your ACEs, you're at greater risk of having a toxic stress response. And so in addition to prescribing this metformin, I want to talk to you about the importance of regulating, recognizing, and uh, uh, responding to an overactive stress response through supportive relationships, uh, mental health treatment, if indicated, right? That's not required for everyone. Exercise, good sleep hygiene, healthy nutrition, and mindfulness practices, right? To supplement with bringing that piece into uh, the patient's awareness and helping them uh, be able to address an overactive stress response is an important part of treating whatever health condition. We want to ensure to validate existing strengths and protective factors, connecting patients to resources and interventions, including educational materials, care coordination, patient navigation, community health workers, community resources, social work, and mental health as necessary, and then follow up, right, using the the presenting symptom, right? So sometimes the presenting symptom is going to be behavioral, but a lot of patients with high ACEs may have no behavioral symptoms, in which case you might use the diabetes or the headaches or the back pain, right, as the clinical indicator and follow along as how, we're, how are we doing in our treatment relative to what your presenting symptom was. So we are, we've offered a, uh, 
two hour training so that every, pro every provider in the state of California, every Medicaid provider, in order to be able to draw down the reimbursement by July 1 needs to be, tr needs to uh, take and attest to having taken a, a two hour training that gives the basics of ACE screening and responding with trauma informed care. We're also in the process of uh, developing further training offerings for the whole spectrum of care providers, including community care workers um, and uh, other parts of the medical team. But all of these trainings need to meet a minimum curriculum developed by my office in the Department of Healthcare Services. And we have also, I'm, now that we're here at UCSF, I'm really pleased to say that we're also um, have launched a statewide learning and quality improvement collaborative that is being led by Dr. Eddie Mochtinger here at UCSF. Dr. Mochtinger, are you in the room? Oh, and as, as well as uh, as well as Onda Quo, uh, who, who is part of the, we have, in fact, who's part of the CalQuick? Just raise your hand real quick. So we have a bunch of uh, clinical leaders uh, here that are really leading um, this groundbreaking, uh, nation-leading work on advancing the standard of care for adverse childhood experiences and toxic stress. And I believe that 20 years from now, I hope to be back here having this conversation that just as, right, we've seen this reduction in cigarettes uh, uh, daily use, just as we've seen this reduction in maternal mortality, just as we've seen this uh, drop in HIV mortality, so I will be showing you a slide yet to be developed on the dramatic drop in adverse childhood experiences and toxic stress in the state of California. Thank you so much for your time and attention.